there. Let's pray. Our merciful Father, thank you so much for bringing us to the Father's house. Father, let us be the planted trees by the stream of water, the source of spring water. Father, let us truly drink the water of life. And from the pulpit, let us hear the melody of your love and praise your glory from the bottom of our heart. And Father, please help us to be united in spirit and love. And may the blood of the cross washes away our sins, no matter how hard life it is. Let us always give thanks to you in prayer so that we can truly receive the miracles of God. And Father, please remember each and every soul who is participating in the sanctuary and from all around the world. And then please help us to be strengthened in spirit and truth so that we can have this victorious life on this earth until we go to heaven. And pray this in the name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Should turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and life, a story of peace and life. For the darkness should turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth. A song to be sung to the nations that shall lend their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shadow the spirit sword. And shadow the spirit sword. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a message to speak to the nations, that we go over in and above. And sent us his son to save us, and show us that God is love. And show us that God is love. Darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a Savior to show to the nations, who the paths of sorrow and throne, that all of the world's great people might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love. Today, a carol to my 
Welcome to the Covenant Torches Wednesday service, which is a two-part service. The first part will be where we pray for those that need prayer, and the second part will be our Bible study. So let's go into our prayer list first. Of course, Pastor John McCurley, keep praying for him as he slowly gets better. Evangelist Susan Ha, you know she's back in New York. We're still praying for you, Susan, okay? Uh, Evangelist Sophia Kim. Pray for her health. Uh, missionary Julie Santiago, we pray, keep her in our prayers. Sherry Craig, uh, Kimberlyn Jones, and uh, the New York clan up there, keep all of them in prayer up there. Uh, Yunsun Mills, she's still recovering from a, a fall that she took. And uh, slowly but surely, she'll be running around the block here pretty soon, okay? <laughs> Uh, pray for uh, Kamsan, pray for her needs, um, pray for young Doris, uh, that you will touch her father and bless her, and Brother Antonio, pray for him. Next slide. Another slide. Oh, okay. Pray for the proclamation of the word. Pray for Barrett Theological Seminary uh, in English and Spanish. And pray for our mother church in Korea, Pyongjo Church. The world missions, we have several world missions. I'm not going to go through them all there, but you can see. First of all, the History of Redemption uh, Seminar is going to be November 11th, uh, 2022. Um, History of Redemption Academy members 
every Friday. I'm not sure how that's going to uh, be done once Sophia departs for Korea. Um, so we may or may not be having that until she returns. I'm not sure. Uh, believers of the Savior Christian or Savior Church in the Philippines, Pastor Herbert uh, and Timothy uh, Gospel, pray for them. The Lamplighters Mission, also pray for them, Guyana. And Salam Church in Nepal, and also Missionary Patriot Paul in Kenya. And also, anyone need to be, I want to uh, put my wife on there for a prayer for her, her health. Is there anyone else? We all should be praying for each other anyways, okay? We have to pray for our Brother Barry, I mean, Elder Barry, and uh, to be strong, okay? And uh, anyone else we need to pray for? Okay. What's the next slide? Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah.
Father God, we thank you for bringing us into your house tonight safely, Father. And Father, we pray for those who are away from church, Father, that you continue to bless them, Father, as they can join us next time. We ask, Father, that you will look down upon this service tonight, Father. We pray that you will find that favorable, Father God. And Father, we pray for our pastor, Pastor Rick Burton, that prepares to deliver this message tonight, Father, and let it touch our hearts, Father, and educate us, prepare us for the end time, for we know that the end time is, is coming and the time is short, and we need to do all we can to prepare ourselves for body, spirit, and mind, Father, to be ready when that time comes, and we long to hear those words, well done, my servant. And Father, can we just say thank you, we come in this church your temple tonight father to get closer to you and to understand your plan for us father as we go forward father we just say thank you and give you all the glory tonight in your precious name in jesus name amen scripture readings are coming from exodus 25 18 and ezekiel 41 18 and 19. exodus 25 18 you shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. It was carved with it was carved with cherubim and palm trees, and the palm tree was between the cherubim and the cher cherub, and every cherub had two faces. A man's face toward the palm tree on one side and a young lion's face toward the palm tree on the other side. They were carved on all the house all around. And tonight's message is the redemptive historical lesson of the cherubim, given by Reverend Eric Burton. Good evening, saints. How's everybody? Well, you know what? You are blessed to be here tonight, amen? And for those who are watching via YouTube and Facebook, we welcome you as well. And we pray that through the message tonight that we can come and draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So tonight I want to share a message with you um, titled, The Redemptive Historical Lesson of the Cherubim. The Redemptive Historical Lesson of the Cherubim. And as we read in our opening text in Exodus chapter 25 verses 18 and Ezekiel 41 18 to 19. So the cherubim this is actually this there's much we can say about the cherubim and we've I'm, I know we've had lessons on this before and there's much we can say but tonight I want to try to uh, look at the history of the cherubim and how the cherubim um, and their, how, their ga how their gaze, um, wherever they look, uh, and the meeting of their gaze. So we want to look at that tonight. And so we're going to try to uh, focus on that. And again, there are many things we can say about the cherubim, but I want to try to focus on tonight on their gaze, on where they're looking and what does that mean. And we're going to look at you know, the history of that. And we're going to try to see what is the redemptive historical meaning of that, okay? According to the Word of God, the Bible speaks of these creatures called cherubim. Uh, and there's other terms that are used, such as cherub, cherub seraphim, living creatures, but they are all referring to the same exact entity, right? So although there's different names for the cherubim, they're all referring to the same entity. So what are the cherubim? What are the cherubim? Simply put, as they would say in layman's terms, okay, cherubim are the missioners of the word. In other words, they are people whom God has called and he has entrusted them with the word of God. And yet, even more specifically, they are the role models or the model of those who have been entrusted with the word of life, okay? So that, in a sense, is what cherubim are, all right? And what is the mission of cherubim? 
What do you think the mission of the cherubim are? Yeah, in, in other words, their, their mission is to guard the way to the tree of life, right? So in order to get to the tree of life, you have to go through the cherubim, right? And that's according to the word of God. Genesis 3.24 says the following. So he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. See that? So the cherubim were placed, right, in, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and they guard the way to the tree of life. See? So this is the mission of the cherubim, to guard the way to the tree of life. So tonight I want to look at more deeply as to the who the cherubim are and what their mission is and especially focus on their gaze when they're looking. What, do they, what, what does it mean when they're looking or when they're looking below or when they're looking up? Okay, what does that mean? So we want to kind of focus on, tech, on that tonight. So again, the title is The Redemptive Historical Lesson of the Cherubim. Main point number one, the cherubim in Moses' tabernacle were looking below. When we study Moses' tabernacle, right, God commanded Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant, and that Ark was placed inside the tabernacle. And Moses built the Ark of the Covenant, and on the, in, the, on the, in the covenant, you got the Ark, at the bottom, and then you got the mercy seat, and then you got the two cherubims that sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant, right? <coughs> Exodus 25, 18 says the following. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat, okay? So this is according to the word of God. Also in Exodus 25, Tim, it says, they shall construct an Ark of uh, acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high, right? So where were these two, the two cherubim, they were placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. They were placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant that Moses, that God commanded Moses to make. And first, there is the Ark of the Testimony at the bottom, and then there's the, the mercy seat, right? And then you have the two cherubim on top of the mercy seat. And this is according to the word of God. Exodus 25, 1 says this, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony which I will give you, right? So you got this, this structure, the ark of the covenant, and the mercy seat is on top of it. And then on top of the mercy seat, you have these two cherubim. These two cherubim, right? And it says that these two cherubim that sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant, on, on top of the mercy seat, their wings are upward and they're facing each other like this, but their heads are looking downward. So their, their wings are touching and they're facing each other, but they're looking down. They're looking down. Exodus 25, 20 says the following. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. See? So they're sitting on top of this, this, this Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, and their, their, their wings are spread forward and up, and they're facing each other, and they're looking down. So their gaze is downward. Their gaze is downward, right? And the Bible says that God meets with us between the two cherubim. So the two cherubim on top of the mercy seat, God says he meets us in between them. And this is according to the word of God. Exodus 25, 22 says the following. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, see that? From between the two cherubim, 
which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. And this is according to the word of God. In other words, through the cherubim, God's voice and his word can be heard and proclaimed. See, and that is what the Bible is telling us. Through the cherubim, between the cherubim, we can hear God's voice. And we can hear his commands. See, God says, I will meet you between the two cherubim. See, and this is where God's voice can be heard, right? Numbers chapter 7, verses 89 says the following. Now when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. See that? So the cherubim guard the way to the tree of life, and the cherubim is where God speaks. It's where we can hear God's voice. See, so you can see here that the cherubim are very, very important. It is where God speaks and is where we can hear his voice, all right? So basically, we can say that the cherubim are like mediators. They're like mediators, right? We know the true me mediator is Jesus Christ. But these cherubim are like mediators. It says also when we look at the entire history of the Bible, in many places it is said that when God appears, the cherubim are are the closest to God. They're the closest to him. Therefore, cherubim are beings who are closest to God and who partake on the role of being a mediator. So these cherubim are very, very close to God. Whenever God appears, you see the cherubim, right? And this is according to the word of God. It says the cherubim in Moses' tabernacle look below. So as they're sitting on top of the mercy seat, they're, they're wings spread out and they're facing each other, but they're looking down and they're looking toward, down towards the mercy seat, right? The ark of the testimony. And this is where their gaze is at. Their gaze is looking down. Their gaze is looking down. And the ark of the testimony shows the period of the what? The law, right? The law, the Ten Commandments, right? This was kept inside the Ark of the Testimony. So these cherubim are looking downward at the law. Therefore, the cherubim looking below means they were looking at the law. And it says here, as they look, their faces were downward, right? Downward. So again, this shows us that man... Fallen mankind cannot keep God's law, right? Fallen man cannot keep God's law. And so when Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God placed a cherubim there. See, God placed a cherubim at the east of the garden there to guard the way back to the tree of life. And this demonstrates that fallen humanity is forbidden from approaching the tree of life. We cannot approach it. See, and this was doing back in the day, right? God placed a cherubim there, right? So again, they're, look, they're on top of the mercy seat and they're looking downward. They're looking downward. And this is according to the word of God. So if we look at Adam's birth, which is 4114 BC, and then until Moses' tabernacle, the cherubim's gaze was, look, was looking down. They were looking down. What were they looking at? They were looking at the law. See? So their gaze is looking downward. See? Their gaze is looking downward. Right? Therefore, it's the period of the law. Thus, through the cherubim, God is looking at the people. And he's lo they're looking at the law. See? See? So their gaze is different here. Their gaze is looking down at the law. And again, fallen mankind cannot receive, you know, the, the oracles of God because they're fallen. So these cherubim are looking downward, right? And this is according to the word of God. And here's a picture of the um, Ark of the Covenant. 
If you look at this picture, at the very bottom, you have the Ark of the Covenant, which is you know, where the law or the testimony. And then there's the mercy seat. See the mercy seat in the middle? And then you have the cherubim. See how the cherubim, they, their, their wings are forward and they're touching each other? And you can't see their faces because they're looking downward. See? But in between the cherubim right there, what do you see? The word. That's where God speaks between the two cherubim. This is where he speaks between the two cherubim. Amen? Our main point number two. The cherubim in Solomon's temple. Now, we just talked about Moses' tabernacle. Now we're looking at the cherubim in Solomon's temple. And it says here in Solomon's temple, the cherubim were looking to the front. So now their gaze has changed. Remember, in Moses' tabernacle, they're looking downward. But in Solomon's temple, the cherubim are looking forward. They're looking front. So their gaze has changed. Their gaze has changed. It says here, according to Exodus chapter 25, I'm, I'm sorry. It says, in Solomon's temple within the inner sanctuary, Solomon made two cherubim. He made two cherubim, right? And this is according to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23. 1 Kings 6, 23 says the following. Also in the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high, okay? So in Moses' tabernacle, you had cherubim on top of the mercy seat, and they're looking forward with their heads down. But in Solomon's temple, these cherubim, these, um, Solomon made two of them, right, and of olive wood, each 10 cubits high, okay? And also, these cherubim stood on their feet in Solomon's temple, they stood on their feet, and this is according to the word of God. Second Chronicles 3.13 says this, The wings of the cherubim extended 20 cubits, and they stood on their feet facing the main room. So these two cherubim are standing. They're not kneeling in, in like this, but they're actually standing, and they're looking straight forward. So now their gaze has changed. Instead of looking downward, they're looking to the front. And this is in Solomon's temple. It says the, the cherubim in Solomon's temple were looking to the front. Therefore, looking from the inner sanctuary to the outer sanctuary is looking to the front. Therefore, the gaze of the cherubim changed from looking below to looking to the front. And their wingspan was 20 cubits from one end of the wall to the other. So in other words, these two cherubim, you got two of them standing, right? And they, their wings are out like this. So this wing is touching the wall, right, which is five cubics. And then this wing right here is touching the wing of the other cherubim to my right. And, and so his wingspan is five cubits, plus his other wing is touching that wall. So that's 20 cubits. And they're standing and they're looking to the front. Okay, so you can see now that these cherubim are standing and now their gaze is to the front. And this is according to the word of God. Let's look at that. Second Chronicles 3.11. It says the wingspan of the cherubim was 20 cubics. The, one, the wing of one of five cubics touched the wall of the house. See, it touched this wall here. And its other wing of five cubits touched the wing of the other cherub, right? And then that wing, his wing, touched my wing. That was five cubits. And then you got his other wing touching the wall. So all together, 20 cubits, right? And this is according to the word of God. It says, God who speaks through the cherubim and now with their gaze looking at the front demonstrates that God wants to meet with us now. He wants to meet with us. And this is what the gaze mean. Now, they're looking to the front. And so now through the cherubim, God is telling his people that he wants to meet with them, right? It says here, the front of the Hebrews, to the front, for Hebrews, the front 
of the Hebrews, I mean, sorry, Hebrews, when, it, when they talk about the front, it means east. So the front means east, right? The front means, means east. And it says here, they consider the east to be the front. So the east is always the front. The east is always the front. And I think I got a slide here. It says east in Hebrew is kadem. Kadem. And then the word kadam meaning to meet. See? So in other words, it's meeting someone from the east. <laughs> right? It means to meet from the east. So for the Hebrews, front means east. And kadam means to meet someone. It means to meet someone. Right? In other words, these two cherubim that are now standing and they're looking forward, they look in front, right? Their eyes went from gazing down to the law and now they're standing and their gaze is now to the front. And what this means is that God wants to meet us. God wants to meet us, right? If we look at Revelation 7, 2, it says this, Then I saw another angel coming up from the east having the seal of the living God. See? See? So the gaze of the cherubim now demonstrates that God wants to meet us, and we have to meet him, right? And this is according to the word of God. In Solomon's temple, the Ark of the Covenant remained under the wings of the cherubim. So just like in Moses' tabernacle, the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant was under the wings. You know, the cherubim sat on top, and the ark was underneath, right? Likewise, in Solomon's temple, although they're standing, the cherubim are standing and they're looking forward, the ark of the covenant is still in the middle, and they're under the wings of the cherubim. They are under the wings of the cherubim. 1 Kings 8, 6 says the following, Then the priest brought out the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the house, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. See, under the wings of the cherubim. So the Ark of the Covenant is still under the wings of the cherubim. But now the cherubim's gaze is to the front instead of looking downward. And it's basically saying, hey, we want you to meet Christ. God is saying, I want to meet you now. I want to meet you, right? You know, meeting under the law means death, right? No man, no fallen man, we can't keep the law. We cannot keep it. So we die. We can't keep God's law. If we break one of them, that's a sin, right? So we could not keep the law. But meeting God under the law means death. However, through the redemption of Jesus Christ, God desires to meet us. He desires to meet us. And that is why he came, right, so that we can meet him. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. See? So again, in Moses' tabernacle, the cherubim looked downward at the law. In Solomon's uh, temple, the cherubim are standing up and they're looking to the front, meaning that God wants to meet us. Now, we're, we're, he, they're pointing us towards what? Grace. They're pointing us towards grace, right? So you can see there on the screen, Moses' tabernacle to Solomon's temple. The cherubim's gaze is now to the front, right? And it's demonstrating that now God is wanting to give us grace. He wants to meet us. And wh who is God's grace? Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ. So here's, I mean, this is not a, a good picture of what I'm talking about. But here are the cherubim, right? Now they're standing, and this is in Solomon's temple. And see their wingspan? So their wings, in the, their wings touch in the middle. The Ark of the Covenant is under their wings. And their, their outer wings are touching the wall. And you see that the cherubim are looking forward, right? They're looking straight forward. They're not looking down, right? They're not looking down. So this is in Solomon's temple. 
See? So the gaze has changed. Amen? Main point number three, our final point. Cherubim in, in Ezekiel's temple were looking above. The cherubim in Ezekiel's temple were looking above. So first, they were looking below in Moses' tabernacle. Then they stood up and they were looking to the front in Solomon's temple. And now in Ezekiel's temple, the cherubim are looking above. The cherubim are looking above. What does this mean? What does this mean? It says, here, according to the Bible, the faces of the cherubim in Ezekiel's temper were looking at the palm trees. They're looking at the palm trees, okay? We've all studied Ezekiel's temple, right? Ezekiel 41, 19 says this, a man's face toward the palm tree on one side, and there's a young lion's face toward the palm tree on the other side, and they were carved on all the house all around. So in Ezekiel's temple, the cherubim are not statues or anything like that, but they're actually carved on the wall, right? So there's a, a, a cherubim, uh, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a um, palm tree, a cherubim, a palm tree, a cherubim, a palm tree. So they're all on the wall, all over. The walls, the, up above the, the door, the ceiling, they're everywhere. Right? They're everywhere. And this is according to the word of God. These palm trees were carved all around the whole temple and on the ceiling. So what does this mean? The cherubim in Ezekiel's temple are looking above. See, now their gaze has changed from looking to the front to above, to above. According to the word of God, the front of the cherubim was the face of a man. And to the right, the face of a lion. And to the left, the face of a bull. And to the rear, the face of an eagle. Right? And this is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. It says, as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion. And on the right, and on the face of a bull, and on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Right? And this is according to God's word. And it says, and these faces of the cherubim were all looking at the palm tree. Right? For the palm trees were carved all over the walls of Ezekiel temple, meaning they were looking above. They were looking above. Ezekiel 41.20 says this. From the ground to above the entrance, cher cherubim and palm trees were carved as well as the walls of the nave. See? So you got these cherubim and palm trees carved all over the house and the wall in Ezekiel's temple. Right? So the cherubim are looking up, above. They're looking above. They're looking above. And what does the face of a man mean? If you look at the screen, it says space of a man. The face of a man is to be is to the front of the cherubim. The face of a man is to the front of the cherubim. And it means east, light, and wisdom. See? So the face of a man means to the east, it means light, and it means wisdom. Right? And this is according to the word of God. Proverbs 3.18 says this, She is a tree of life, and to those who take hold of her and happy are are all who hold her fast, right? So this is what the face of the man signifies. Proverbs 9, 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, right? So again, this face of the man is talking about light, it's talking about the east, it's talking about wisdom, right? And this is according to the word of God. What about the face of the lion? What does the face of the lion mean? The face of the lion means this. The face of a lion is to the right. And to the right means power and might. Power and might. And this is recorded in the word of God. 
Proverbs 30 and 30 says, The lion which is mighty among the beasts and does not retreat before any. See, the lion is the mighty. He's the mighty among the beasts, and he does not retreat. In other words, he's not afraid, right? Also in Proverbs 28, 1, it says this, The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. See? So therefore, among the four faces of the cherubim, the faces of the man and lion looking and gazing at the palm trees reveal that the people can overcome all things through Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom and the power of the word, the word of redemptive history, right? So when we are gazing up at Christ, we can overcome. See, and this is why the cherubim in Ezekiel Temple are looking up, meaning now we have to overcome. We have to overcome. 1 Corinthians one twenty four says the following, But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of of God. See? So therefore, the palm tree signifies the righteous, and the righteous are those who overcome. Right? And secondly, the righteous refers to those who are planted in the house of God and bear fruits for God. So the righteous are those who overcome, planted in the house of God, and they bear fruit. Right? And these are those who are able to look up, right? Through the cherubim, we are able to look up and receive Christ, right? Psalm 92, 13 says this, Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God, right? So the core message of the inner sanctuary of Ezekiel's temple is that the cherubim are looking at the palm trees, and on the doors, the walls, the ceiling, and on all sides are the images of the cherubim looking at those who have overcome. That's why they're looking up, because they're looking at those who have overcome. And I believe all of you here who are sitting here have overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is according to the word of God. So Solomon's temple to Ezekiel's temple. The gaze changed from looking front to looking above. See that? And this is talking about the period of the word. God now is saying that now we have to be able to receive the word of life. See? We have to be able to receive the word. Right? And I believe we're in that period. God is saying we must receive the word of life. And this is according to the word of God. If we receive the word of life, then we are able to overcome. We are able to to overcome, right? So here's a picture. This is not a great picture of it, but this is Ezekiel's temple. And you see you have a palm tree, a cherub, a cherubim, a palm tree, a cherub, and they're all over the place. They're all over the place, right? And this is according to Ezekiel's temple. In conclusion, so what is the redemptive, redemptive historical lesson of the cherubim? Cherubim are God's messengers who appear from Genesis to Revelation. Cherubim are God's messengers who appear from Genesis to Revelation. And their gaze or whatever they look at is the will of the Father. So they only look where God commands them to look. Right? Psalm 99.1 says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. See that? Let the earth shake. So, the cherubim, wherever God is, God's cherubim are there. Right? So these angelic beings, from, from Genesis to Revelation, they've been showing us right? Pointing us into the direction, right? Through God's word. And that is according to the word of God. This is what the cherubim is all about. It says, and with the power and might of God, God's cherubim 
are cheering you on to move from under the law to God's grace, which is Christ Jesus, and then finally to the word of redemptive history. See, so from Genesis up until now, God's cherubim have been cheering you on, cheering the people of God on. Come on, come on, you know, graduate to the next level. And this is the mission of the cherubim, cheering you on, right? So what is God cherubim doing today? What is he telling us today? We must be able to graduate, right? We must go further. We must go up. We must receive the word of life, the word of redemptive, um, redemptive history, right? And this is according to the word of God. Where we can eat, right? When we eat, when we can eat the word of God, right? The word of life, then we are able to overcome. We are able to overcome and partake in the divine nature. See, that word, the word of life, the word of redemptive history, we, we, we become divine. We are put on divine, divin, um, divine. we're put on a, a divine nature. In other words, this corrupt nature that we have now, this, this flesh and blood, we'll put on a divine nature when we can receive the word of redemptive history. And this is according to to the word of God. Revel uh, Revelation 2 7 says the following To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. See? This is in the paradise of God. So we have to be able to overcome. We have to be able to overcome. And how do we do that? By eating the word of life, receiving the word of life, the last trumpet, right? The word of transfiguration. If we eat that word, then we're able to put on the, a divine nature. And this is according to the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to um, 52 says the following. We will not all sleep, meaning that we will all not die. But we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the what? Last trumpet. The last trumpet. And this is according to the word of God. And I believe that here at the Covenant of the Torch Church, you are receiving the last trumpet. And if you can receive that word, then we'll be able to go above, right? And that is why the cherubim are now looking above. Come on up. Come on up. They're cheering us, right? We have to be able to graduate and go up and receive the word of life. Amen. And I pray that as we listen to God's word, as we listen to the word of life, let us be able to overcome so we may eat and partake of that fruit and that we may be able to um, go up and that we may be able to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen? Amen. And our blessings upon you in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy tonight. Father, through the message you have taught us, Father God, that, Father, we must be able to progress, Father God, that we must be able to come and eat, Father God, of the tree of life in the paradise of God so that, Father God, we may go up, that we may go up, that we may meet you, and that we may be with you forever. We thank you so much, Father God, for giving us life, and we ask, Father God, your continued blessings upon all the covenant of the Torch Church saints, and Father God, may we be able to go out and proclaim your special word, this, this precious word that you have given to us, so that others may come and partake of the word of life, the word of transfiguration. We thank you so much, Father God, for this precious church, and Father God, we thank you so much for all the saints here tonight and those who are watching via YouTube and Facebook. May your blessings continue to be with them, and we forever give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Give God some praise. Amen. Let's sing our final hymn, hymn number 384. <laughs>
gives me grace for every trial, leads me with living breath. Oh, Father God, it's that time when we give back to you a small portion of what you've blessed us to be. Father, we just thank you for all the grace that you've shown us, Father. And Father, as we continue forward, Father, we ask that you will continue to watch over us, Father, and keep us safe, Father. And now as we pre present our tithes and offerings to you, Father, we do it with love for you and your precious word. And Father, we just say thank you, and we ask that you will show us, guide us, and direct us in your ways, Father. And Father, we know that we have not led a perfect life. We know we all have sinned, Father. But through your Son, Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to, for that eternal life, Father. Amen. And until we meet again, Father, we continue to give our tithes and offerings to you that we can grow this church, Father, and grow it in word and spirit, Father. In your precious name we say, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> pray once again father god we thank you for your precious opportunity for this precious opportunity to give back to you once again father god which you have given to us and we ask that through the giving from all the saints father god bless them father god uh, according to their faith father heal them father god bless their hands bless their bodies bless all that they do father god in the name of jesus christ and we ask father god that through the giving here today at the Covenant of the Torch Church. Father God, may your precious word of redemptive history be proclaimed to all nations. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. As for the announcements, uh, 2022, the Oju Summer Conference. Again, it's going to be August 1 to 3. Uh, 2022 Youth and Youth Al Adult Conference, Reconnect, that's 1 through 4 July, that's coming up very quickly, um, and the pastor and the evangelist of Wei will be going along with five others from the church. Uh, women's Group Seminar, uh, be June 16th, Thursday, which is tomorrow at 10 a.m., hosted by Evangelist Sophia Kim. Lord's Day Bible Study at 945. That takes place prior to our Sunday service. 
and we keep growing one by one, we're going to have pretty soon the whole screen be these little blocks with everybody's face on it. Okay. Uh, the History of Redemption Academy, uh, that's book four, Friday, 930. That's mainly for the international pastors uh, to educate them. The Church Building Fund, again, just use special envelopes when you do and keep it separate from your tithes and offerings. And, oh yeah, and Father's Day is coming up this coming Sunday, and I understand that the, the women have something planned for us. So that's as far as I'll say for that. Let's <laughs> all so, so rise with singing hymn number one and then close with a benediction. I know they have something planned, right? <laughs> By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the abundant love of God the Father, the inspiration, the fellowship, the indwelling, and the filling of the Holy Spirit, today, Father God, may we heed the voice of the cherubim. And Father God, may we graduate, Father God, and go up above. Let us be able to partake of the word of life, the word of redemptive history so that, Father God, we may be able to don the divine nature. Father, we ask this blessing upon this church, the saints, their families, their businesses, and in all that they do from now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>